Chapter 5 Ezra's body stiffened. With a low grunt, the man tightened his grip and held the knife blade tight against Ezra's skin. Stop! Please! cried Jonathan. We have done nothing wrong. George Good was a child of a witch, said the man. His evil brought the plague to our village, and he escaped it. What do you want with George Good? We are no friends of his. Believe me, Ezra choked out. We wish him nothing but harm. The man relaxed a little, easing the knife blade back a few inches from Ezra's throat. Get off my farm, he growled. Do not come back, ever, and never dare to ask about the villainous goods again. He released Ezra. Ezra and Jonathan hurried to the wagon and drove off. Remember this day, son, Ezra said solemnly. This is further proof of the evil of the goods. We are not the only people they have harmed. The next day, Jonathan's father went back to searching the house. I must have missed something, Jonathan heard him muttering. What are they hiding? What are they hiding? Jonathan carried a stack of firewood inside one morning as his mother sat sewing by the hearth with Rachel on her lap. Abigail stood over a basin full of water, scrubbing the last of the breakfast dishes. Mama says I have no more chores to do today, Abigail said happily. Not until supper time. I am going to go exploring. Watch her, Jonathan, please, said his mother. Do not let her stray too far. Abigail tossed the dirty dishwater out the door and wiped her hands on her apron. She pulled on her cap and ran outside, the blue ribbons on her cap flying. Jonathan followed her. Shall we go to the creek, he suggested. I have already been to the creek, said Abigail. I want to go into the village. Jonathan stopped. Into Wickham? But why, Abby? There is nobody there. I know, said Abigail. We can go anywhere we like. There is no one to stop us. No, said Jonathan. Mama said you should not stray too far. The village is too far. Are you scared, Jonathan? Jonathan bristled. Was his younger sister daring him? Nothing scares me, he said, although he knew that was not true. His father scared him, for one, and all those dead people in the village. Come on, said Abigail. I am going to the village. If you must keep an eye on me, then you will just have to come along. She ran down the road with Jonathan following close. He felt nervous about going back to the village, but he could not let his younger sister go alone. The streets were as quiet and empty as before. The silence roared in Jonathan's ears. He heard no dogs barking, no birds chirping, no insect sounds. What do you think they were like? Abigail whispered. The people who lived here. I do not know, said Jonathan. Like us, I suppose. They walked down the dirt road to the village common. Abigail found a small pile of bones lying under a tree. Look, Jonathan, she said sadly. This was a puppy. Jonathan stared at the grisly little skeleton. Maybe we should not be here, he thought. He glanced around. Were all the people in the town really dead? The poor puppy should not have to lie here in the sun like this, said Abigail. I think we should bury him. We have no shovel, said Jonathan. We can get one, Abigail said, indicating the houses and sheds all around them. I am sure any one of these sheds will have a shovel in it. We cannot just take somebody's shovel, Abby, Jonathan said. Why not, Abigail demanded. It is not stealing. They are dead. Yes, Jonathan thought, they are dead, and their bodies are still sitting inside these houses, just as this puppy's bones are lying out here in the sun. Jonathan shuddered. He did not want Abigail to go into one of the houses to find a dead person. I will get a shovel, he said. You wait here. He walked up to the nearest house. Maybe the house where the puppy had lived, Jonathan thought. It was a little wooden cottage, only two rooms. Abigail stood right behind him as he gingerly pushed open the door. I told you to stay by the tree, Jonathan said gruffly. I want to come with you, she said. I am too scared to be alone. Jonathan sighed and took her hand. It was dark inside the cottage. Jonathan's eyes took a moment to adjust to the darkness. Abigail clutched Jonathan's sleeve. They stood frozen in a doorway. Then Abigail whispered, Go get the shovel. Jonathan stepped carefully across the room. He opened a cupboard beside the back door of the cottage. Inside the cupboard, something gleamed white with two dark and empty eye sockets glaring out. A skeleton. Jonathan leapt back. Abigail screamed. The skeleton shifted. It toppled out of the closet and clattered to the floor. Jonathan leaned over it, panting, trying to slow the frantic beating of his heart. Then he started backing away. Wait, Abigail whispered. I see a shovel in the cupboard. Jonathan forced himself to glance back into the cupboard. He saw the shovel, but he did not want to get it. Get it! demanded Abigail. She gave him a shove. He stepped carefully around the clutter of bones on the floor. 
all that remained of the skeleton. Then, holding his breath, he snatched the shovel and ran out of the house. He was glad to be back outside in the bright sunlight. He followed Abigail to the tree and dug a little hole. Then he laid the puppy's bones in the grave. Abigail stood beside him with a branch in her hand. Dominatio per malum, she chanted solemnly, waving the branch over the puppy's grave. What does that mean? Jonathan asked. I do not know, said Abigail. Those are the words on that sparkly thing that Papa wears around his neck. Jonathan knew the words, too. The silver pendant with four blue stones had always fascinated him. He had once asked his father what the words meant, but Ezra refused to tell him. Squinting against the bright sunlight, Jonathan covered the bones with dirt. Then Abigail planted the branch in the ground as a marker. They were late for supper that evening. Ezra was already seated at the table, with his usual preoccupied expression. Jonathan entered the kitchen first, and Ezra barked at him, Where have you been? Outside, was all Jonathan said. Abigail came in next, and Ezra smiled. She went to him and gave him a kiss. He played with the blue ribbons on her cap. You are keeping an eye on your sister, I hope, Ezra said to Jonathan. Yes, Papa, Jonathan replied quietly. He revealed nothing about going into the village. He knew it would make his father angry. Abigail kept it a secret, too. A few days later, Jonathan saw Abigail skipping past the barn, heading for the road. Alarmed, he chased after her. Where are you going? he called. To the village, she replied without stopping. He took her hand and pulled her to a stop. You cannot go, he said sternly. I am supposed to be watching you. You can watch me in the village, she replied impatiently. Jonathan sighed and followed after her. That day they found the skeletons of two small animals, possibly a cat and a chipmunk. Abigail insisted on burying them too. I am going to come back as often as I can, she told her brother as she stuck a branch in the ground by the tiny graves. I will find all the poor dead animals and bury them all. The next time Abigail set out for the village, Jonathan didn't try to stop her. He knew it was useless. He was getting used to the village and all its death, and didn't even mind the awful silence so much any more. Then, one day, when they were playing in Wickham, Abigail came across the remains of a little girl. The skeleton wore a rotting blue dress that once must have been pretty, and a cap like Abigail's. I think we should bury her, said Abigail. She deserves a proper funeral, as much as an animal does. We will need a coffin, Jonathan said. We cannot bury a person in the dirt like a dog or a cat. Yes, agreed Abigail. You go find a box, and I will look for a place to bury her. Jonathan crossed the village common and entered the tavern to search for a girl-sized box. He found a wooden crate. It was a little short, but it would have to do. He hoisted the crate onto his shoulder and carried it outside to Abigail. He didn't see her by the meeting house where he had left her. Abigail, he called, immediately worried. No answer. After setting the crate on the ground, he walked down the road. He heard high-pitched giggling behind the village magistrate's house. Jonathan peered around the side of the house. He uttered a low cry of surprise when he spotted Abigail. She was playing with another little girl. Jonathan stared at the little girl, startled to see another living person in Wickham. She was skinny, with long blonde curls poking out from under her cap, and gray eyes. Where on earth had she come from, he wondered. He started toward his sister. Abigail, he began. At the sight of him, the other little girl darted behind a tree. You frightened her, Jonathan, Abigail scolded. No need to worry, Hester, she called to her friend. It is only my brother. But the little girl did not come out from behind the tree. She must be afraid of boys, Abigail said. She hurried behind the tree to look for the girl. A second later, Abigail reappeared bewildered. She is gone, she told her brother. She disappeared, and we were having so much fun together. Abby, who is she? asked Jonathan. She told me her name is Hester, Abigail answered. She is very nice. Where does she live? Abigail shrugged. She did not say, but I hope she comes back. It was so pleasant to have someone to play with. Jonathan wondered who this playmate could possibly be. Did she live in Wickham? Could there still be living people in the village? What a mystery. The next day, as Jonathan was digging a grave for a baby, Abigail had wandered off to find a stick for a marker. When Jonathan finished digging the hole, Abigail still had not returned. She may be playing with her friend again, Jonathan thought. I think I will watch them for a few minutes and see what I can learn about that strange girl. He crept over to the big house, but the girls were not there. He found them playing in the graveyard. Ducking behind a grave slab, he leaned against a cold stone and spied on them. Hester twirled around and laughed. 
She had a pretty bell-like laugh, Jonathan thought. Just then, Hester took Abigail's hand, and the two girls wove a path through the gravestones. Hester stopped before a hole in the ground. She reached down to tug at something in the hole. Up came the lid of a coffin. Jonathan stood frozen, watching. Hester stepped into the coffin and reached up for Abigail's hand. Abigail touched Hester's hand. With a firm jerk, Hester pulled Abigail into the coffin. Chapter 6 Abigail, no, Jonathan shouted. He burst from his hiding place and ran to the grave. I must get her out of there, he thought, his heart pounding. I must save her. He stopped at the edge of the hole, stared down, and... Abigail popped up out of the coffin, laughing. Furious, Jonathan grabbed her arms and yanked his little sister out of the coffin. Stop playing foolish games, he scolded angrily. We have to go home now. But Jonathan, Hester and I... Refusing to listen to her protests, he pulled her along behind him. We must get away from here, he thought, forgetting the other girl. Abigail dragged her feet and glanced back at Hester. Why do we have to go home? she asked. I was having fun. We just do. Jonathan didn't want to admit the truth. He was afraid. Afraid of what? Of a little girl? He did not know. But he knew that something was not right. Jonathan, you and Abby must stay in today, his mother said. I need you both to watch Rachel for me. Abigail groaned. I wish we could go back to the village, she whispered to Jonathan. I was looking forward to playing with Hester. But Jonathan was secretly relieved. He said nothing about it to Abigail, but he was determined not to go to Wickham any more. Hester pulled Abby into an open coffin, he remembered with a shudder. I must keep Abby away from her. Jonathan and Abigail were playing with Rachel in front of the hearth, rolling a ball along the floor to her when Ezra appeared. Hello, Papa, said Abigail brightly. Ezra flashed her a smile. Would you like to go for a walk with me? I need a bit of air. Mama asked me to watch Rachel today, Abigail told him. Jonathan can watch Rachel, said Ezra. Come along with me. I like your company. Abigail jumped up and went outside with her father. Feeling a little hurt, Jonathan watched them through the window. He gasped when he saw her. Hester. Jonathan saw her run up to Abigail and Ezra. Curious, Jonathan picked up Rachel and hurried outside to see what would happen. He could see the surprise on his father's face as Abigail introduced Hester to him. Where do you live, Hester? Ezra asked. Nearby, Hester replied shyly. And who were your parents? Ezra demanded. Mama and Papa, answered the blonde little girl. Ezra pointed in the direction of the farmhouses a few miles down the road. So you live there? She is a good girl, Papa, Abigail interrupted, her eyes shining. She was clearly happy to have a playmate. Hester turned her sparkling gray eyes on Ezra and asked, Can Abigail come to my house? Abigail tugged at his sleeve. Please, Papa, she begged. Please. Jonathan stepped forward. Do not let her go, Papa, he said. Ezra turned sharply to his son. Why not? Jonathan glanced at Hester and Abigail. I cannot say, Papa. I just know that you must not let her go. Please, let me go with Hester, Abigail said. It is so good to have a friend. Tears were forming in her eyes. Ezra gazed lovingly at his daughter. Jonathan knew his father could deny Abigail nothing. He knew what would happen next. All right, Abigail, you may go. Papa, Jonathan urged, let me go with her. No, Ezra said firmly, you will stay here. Someone must watch the baby. But, Papa, you heard me, Jonathan, Ezra said, his temper rising. You were too old to play with little girls. You will stay here. He turned to Abigail and added, Run along, but be home for supper. I will, Abigail called back happily. She ran off with Hester, the blue ribbons on her cap flying behind her. Jonathan stared after his sister, watching her until they disappeared over the hill. Jonathan, your mother is calling you, said Ezra. Do you not hear? Yes, Papa, said Jonathan. He carried Rachel inside to his mother. The sun had gone down, and Abigail had not returned home. Supper is ready, Jonathan, his mother said. I will take Rachel now. She picked up the baby and put her into the wooden high chair. Jonathan took his place at the table, gazing at the darkening sky beyond the window. Supper, and still Abby is not home, he thought anxiously. His mother took a pot of chicken stew off the fire and called Ezra to the kitchen. Jonathan could see that his father was worried, too. Deep lines furrowed Ezra's brow, and his eyes were dark and troubled, but Jonathan did not dare say a word. 
Jane Fear went to the door and called, Abigail, supper. There was no response. Where is that girl? Jane wondered aloud. She went off to play with a friend, Ezra said quietly. I expect she will be back soon. A friend? said Jane. What friend? A little girl, Ezra answered. He looked uncomfortable. A sweet girl. She lives nearby. Jane glanced at Jonathan. He knew she wanted him to explain to her, but he said nothing. He knew his mother was frightened, too, but she tried to hide it. The stew is getting cold, she said stiffly. We shall have to start without her. She dished out the chicken stew. The family began to eat. No one spoke. Beyond the window, the sky darkened. Still no sign of Abigail. Jonathan glanced up. His mother met his eyes. He turned to Ezra, who was carefully cutting the bits of chicken into smaller and smaller pieces, but not eating a single one. Jane Fear suddenly stood up. Ezra, I am worried, she said. What could be keeping her? Ezra stared out at the black sky. He wiped his mouth with his napkin and stood up. I am going to look for her, he said. Let me go with you, Papa, Jonathan said. No, Ezra snapped. Stay with your mother and sister. He threw on his hat. Then he took the lamp from his hook by the fireplace, lit it with a twig, and walked out into the darkness. I must go with him, Jonathan thought desperately. He does not know where to search. Only I do. He decided to follow Ezra. I do not want to leave you alone, Mama, he said, but Papa needs my help. Jane nodded and said, Go with him. Jonathan slipped outside, following a few paces behind the glow of his father's lantern. The evening sky was purple, glowing darker every second. A crescent moon hovered over the horizon. Abigail, Ezra called. Abigail. He began to walk down the road toward the other farmhouses, away from Wickham. He is going the wrong way, Jonathan thought in frustration. But then he saw his father stop and stand still, as if he were listening to something. Jonathan listens, too. There is a soft, sweet sound. Laughter. A little girl's laughter. Where was it coming from? Ezra turned in confused circles. The laughter seems to float on the air from all directions at once. The voice giggled again. Now it sounded as if it came from the village. Ezra walked toward it, following the sound. Jonathan trailed his father into the village. He had never seen it at night before. It felt emptier than ever. Ezra's lantern cast eerie shadows on the trees and houses. The shadows made the houses seem to move and breathe. Abigail, Ezra called again, then stopped and listened. The little laugh chimed on the wind. Is that you, Abigail? Ezra called out. Where are you? The laugh came again, a little louder, like the tinkling of sleigh bells. That is not Abigail, Jonathan thought. His father seems to realize it, too. Who are you? Ezra called. Show yourself to me. The only response was another girlish giggle. Ezra moves toward it, with Jonathan right behind him, staying far enough behind not to be seen. Jonathan followed his father to the graveyard. Ezra stumbled among the crooked gravestones, the little laugh teasing him, taunting him, leading him farther into the maze of headstones. The lantern flashed a ghoulish yellow light on the gray markers. Abigail, Ezra cried, his voice cracking now, please come out. Ezra stopped again to listen, but this time there was no laughter. Jonathan crept up closer and stood right beside his father. Ezra did not notice. Ezra was standing at the foot of a grave. He held the lantern out, so it illuminated the name on the marker. It read, Hester Good. Jonathan could hear Ezra gasp. Good? Did the marker really say Hester Good? Then a light breeze blew, and on the breeze came the sound of a voice. Not laughter this time, but words. Words spoken in the same girlish voice that had led them to this spot. Can Abigail come to my house? Hester. Hester's grave. Hester was not living, Jonathan realized of his horror. Hester was dead. But still she called. Can Abigail come to my house? Still she called. Called from the grave. Abby's little playmate, giggling and calling from the grave. Can Abigail come to my house? Slowly, Ezra moves the lantern to the right. His hand trembled. He nearly dropped the lantern as it cast its light on another grave, freshly dug, with a new headstone. The light fell across the inscription on the gray stone. It read, Abigail Fear. No! Ezra tossed back his head and howled. The lantern slid from his hand and rolled into the dirt. Ezra dropped to his knees, still howling. Abigail! Abigail! He cried over and over, clawing at the dirt, trying to dig her up. 
Shuddering in terror, Jonathan bent over his father, reached for his father's heaving shoulders, and tried to stop his father's mournful cries. Ezra pushed him roughly away. The breeze blew again, and with it came the laughter, and the taunting request, Can Abigail come to my house? Uttering animal cries, Ezra tore at the dirt with his fingers. Desperate, Jonathan began to dig too. Ezra made no move to stop him now. It was a shallow grave. Jonathan's fingers soon touched the smooth, polished wood of a coffin. No, Ezra shrieked. No, please, no. With a grunt, he shoved Jonathan out of the way and tore open the lid of the coffin. There lay little Abigail, her eyes closed, her lips white, her face a pale, bluish mask. She was dead. Curse them! Curse them! Ezra screamed. The goods will pay. They will burn again. Then his expression changed. The hatred melted into grief and horror. He lowered his face to his hands, sobbing, Abigail, Abigail. Jonathan choked back his own tears and helped his weeping father to his feet. Holding each other and sobbing, they stood motionless in the silent darkness. Hester Good's gleeful laughter surrounded them, ringing in their ears. No matter how they tried, they couldn't stop her gleeful chant. Abigail came to my house. Abigail came to my house. Part 2 Western Massachusetts, 1743 Chapter 7 And ever since that day, our family has been cursed. The goods will not let us live in peace. That is why we must find them and put an end to this horror once and for all. Jonathan Fear stopped outside his sister Rachel's bedroom door to listen. Their father, Ezra, was putting Rachel to bed. Every night, Ezra told his daughter a bedtime story. But instead of reciting a fairy tale, Ezra told her the story of the family curse. Some bedtime story, Jonathan thought sadly. I am surprised it does not give her nightmares. I do not want to go to sleep, Papa, Rachel said. Please, let me stay up a little longer. It is still a light out. No, Ezra replied firmly. Get into bed and stay here this time. I mean it. Jonathan smiled as he heard this. Rachel always hated going to bed before everyone else. But Jonathan does not have to go to bed, she whined. Jonathan is almost eighteen, and you are a little nine-year-old girl, said Ezra. I do not want to hear any more about it. Shut your eyes. Good night. Jonathan hurried down the hall before Ezra came out of Rachel's room. He did not want his father to catch him eavesdropping. It has been six years since we left Wickham, Jonathan thought. Six years since Abby died, and Papa is more obsessed with the goods than ever. Jonathan ran his index finger along the freshly painted wall of their new house. The third house in six years, Jonathan thought bitterly. Papa promised this would be the last move. We shall see. Every time we move, he says he is positive he has found the goods. But still, we have not found them yet. Jonathan started down the stairs his black shoes loud on the wooden steps. He wore white stockings with buckled shoes and dark green knee breeches. His shirt was white cotton with a plain ruffle. His mother no longer made his clothes. She had no need to. All the fears had their clothes made by a seamstress now. The fears had grown rich in the last six years. Whenever they moved to a new town, Ezra brought with him some goods, tea, spices, fancy silks, to sell to the townspeople. His instinct for selling was uncanny. In each town, Ezra knew exactly what the people would need. Thanks to his ability, the family was now quite comfortable, but their new wealth had not brought Ezra peace. As Jonathan reached the bottom of the stairs, he heard a knock at the front door. I will answer it, Mama, he called. He could hear her in the kitchen unpacking. Jonathan opened the front door. There stood a very pretty girl who appeared to be about 16 or 17 years old. She had smooth brown hair, pulled back into a knot at the nape of her neck. She wore a simple green dress with white ruffles at the neckline and the sleeves. She gazed at Jonathan with lively brown eyes and smiled. Good evening, said the girl, dropping into a quick curtsy. She held a round dish covered with a cloth in one hand. My name is Delilah Wilson. I live on the farm down the road. Please come in, offered Jonathan. I know you moved in today, and I thought you might like something more with your supper, Delilah said. She held out the round dish as she stepped through the doorway. I have brought you an apple pie. Jonathan took the pie and thanked her. It was still warm. Please come into the parlor, Miss Wilson, he said. I will tell my mother and father that you are here. I know they would like to meet you. 
He showed Delilah into the parlor and took the pie into the kitchen to his mother. How kind of her, Jane Fear said. Go get your father. We can have some pie and invite our new neighbor to share it with us. Wiping her hands on her apron, she hurried to the parlor to meet Delilah. Jonathan knocked on the door of his father's study. Come in, his father called gruffly. Jonathan opened the front door. Most of his father's books and maps, his business records, and the family Bible were still packed up in crates. Ezra sat at his desk, facing the doorway, bent over a map. What is it now? Ezra demanded impatiently. His black hair was shot through with pewter gray now, and the lines in his face had deepened. He did not look up from his map of western Massachusetts. Jonathan knew his father was following a new trail that he imagined the goods might have taken. Papa, a young woman has come to see us, one of our neighbors. So? Jonathan cleared his throat. Well, she would like to meet you. Not just now. I am busy. Jonathan stood in the doorway for a moment, unsure of what to do next. The silver pendant his father always wore flashed in the candlelight, the blue stones gleaming. Ezra said, Close the door behind you. Jonathan started into the hall on his way back to the parlor. On his way, he heard a light step on the stairs. He glanced up. Rachel, dressed in a light summer nightgown, was creeping down the steps. Rachel, cried Jonathan. You heard Papa. Rachel raised a finger to her lips to quiet him. Who is here? she whispered. One of our neighbors? I want to meet her. Papa will be very angry. But Rachel ignored him. She ran quickly down the stairs and slipped into the parlor, Jonathan right behind her. His mother was talking to Delilah. When she saw Rachel, Jane Fear opened her eyes wide in astonishment and cried out, Abigail! 